the last 25 years, I've been actively involved in uh, design and manufacturing of various types of active fire protection systems. So we're going to take a look at a little bit about what are some of the challenges in terms of protection for cold storage facilities, how we uh, look at different uh, types of protection, and ultimately how we determine uh, what is the best type of protection for a particular occupancy. So there's a lot of uh, interesting risks and challenges associated with these types of occupancies. Certainly uh, how we look at construction and the materials that we use in construction uh, creates a, uh, a challenge. We see a lot of trends as we move towards non-combustible uh, or fire resistive uh, insulation uh, in terms of material construction. Now as we kind of look at different types of refrigerated warehousing, the, the risk and the fire challenge varies on how a facility is going to be utilized and how a facility is going to be run. When we have a facility that's attached to processing, we tend to have a consistent type of material that will uh, go into that facility uh, over, over the course of a year. You know, that's going to differ in fire risk and fire challenge from a facility that may have uh, seasonal materials that may come in, or a facility that may lease out uh, portions of, of, their, uh, uh, of their freezers or coolers uh, to other companies, and they'll have, a, uh, companies have an influx of materials that are coming in. How that material is stored, how that material uh, might, uh, uh, might be packaged, can vary. And so we begin to kind of look at those scenarios and have to address different ways of uh, providing active fire protection. Another consideration uh, relates to the temperatures that we would expect within a particular, within a particular occupancy. And you're going to have uh, different levels of uh, cold temperatures that we have to deal with. And uh, depending upon what those temperatures might be, we may choose a different form of fire protection. So if I have a uh, principal warehouse area where I'm uh, storing most of my goods, I may have a completely different type of fire protection within a, a, a loading dock space where I have my material handling equipment or I'm loading my trucks. And so I look at both of those scenarios and ultimately determine what type of protection uh, we need for the, uh, for the system. Now, uh, historically, we looked at most uh, products as you know, really being a non-combustible with some sort of combustible packaging. But what we've seen over the uh, last uh, 15, 20 years is a significant increase in the amount of plastics that are now being utilized uh, within, uh, within uh, storage of, of frozen foods, whether it's how we wrap uh, the, uh, the frozen foods, whether it's uh, trays that those frozen, uh, frozen foods might sit on. And as we increase the amount of plastics, ultimately we increase the fire severity and we have to rethink how we look at uh, fire protection within those spaces. Now, uh, in terms of uh, fire protection systems, our fire protection systems are made up of the overhead automatic sprinklers, like the sprinklers that we have in the room, the piping that connects those, uh, the valves, uh, a water supply, and in some cases we may even have uh, a fire detection system that's part of that, uh, uh, that overall active fire protection uh, configuration. Now when we look at all of those pieces, it's important that at the initial uh, stage of a project, we have the proper design, uh, and then uh, that that design is properly installed, and then for the life of the facility, those systems are properly maintained. Now in terms of fire protection systems, there's a couple of different uh, configurations that we might take a look at. The first being a wet or water-filled uh, system. Now, uh, a room like this, uh, if you have office space attached to your freezer, those would be examples of where you would have that water-filled uh, system. 
In other areas, uh, like the loading dock, for instance, you know, we may not want to have water within that piping system. Uh, in those particular cases, we might put uh, compressed gas or some sort of uh, uh, air pressure within our piping system because we still are concerned about uh, possibly freezing within that piping. Um, so we don't want to necessarily have water immediately available. In a system like that, once a sprinkler opens, you know, water is uh, going to ultimately enter into that piping and flow out those automatic sprinklers, but there's going to be a delay. Now when we get into the uh, principal uh, storage areas within a freezer, what we most uh, commonly find is what we refer to as a pre-action system. Now pre-action systems tie in both the active fire protection as well as, uh, as, well as supplemental uh, detection, usually heat detection. Within those particular system configurations, what makes the uh, pre-action system special uh, is that you have to have both events occur. So if I was uh, operating a facility and I had a pre-action system within my warehouse, if, uh, if someone were to hit uh, a sprinkler with a load of material and activate that sprinkler, if they hadn't uh, done anything with a detection system, right, we would lose air pressure within the piping but we wouldn't set off the valves. The valves would be, remain closed and no water would enter uh, into the piping. In the case of the pre-action system, what we first have to have is heat detectors that are installed within the freezer, identify that a fire exists. And then once we have detection, what we will then wait for the automatic sprinklers to open. And once an automatic sprinkler opens, then water is released into the piping and will flow out any of those open uh, sprinklers. We call that a double interlock uh, pre-action system. And that's the most common system type that we would expect in a, uh, in a freezer configuration. Now there's different ways of, kind of uh, taking those systems to, uh, and pulling those parts and pieces together. Uh, this is a typical uh, cabinet arrangement where all of the system components that are necessary to feed the piping for your uh, pre-action system is housed in one box. Uh, another uh, critical element within these systems is the, how we pressurize that piping. And there are really kind of two ways of approaching the pressurization of our piping. We either utilize uh, nitrogen or we use uh, dry air. And it's really important that as we kind of look at our systems and how we install them and how we maintain them, especially for the freezer environments, that we are using uh, dry air. Uh, if I tried to use a regular compressor uh, in a freezer, what would happen is that I would pull the uh, air from outside, there would be moisture uh, in that air, and that moisture would begin to uh, form ice crystals inside my piping. And we can actually have a situation where our piping becomes blocked with ice if we're not getting our air from the right locations. So we're always very cognizant of that from a system side. The next thing that we uh, kind of take a look at is uh, the type of sprinklers that we choose to utilize within these spaces. And based on the conditions that we would expect uh, within a freezer, based on uh, temperature, uh, based on uh, the system type, uh, the dry systems or pre-action systems, what we find is that there's really three uh, different types of sprinklers that are principally used within uh, these spaces. Now as we look at uh, these sprinklers, how the sprinkler activates and how a sprinkler performed uh, is very much tied to specific characteristics of a sprinkler type. So let's talk a little bit about what makes an automatic sprinkler work. So this is a glass bulb sprinkler. The, the sprinklers in this room uh, are glass bulbs. 
And what happens is that each automatic sprinkler is individually thermally sensitive, meaning that uh, each reacts to the fire separately and independently. And only those sprinklers that are exposed to heat will actually be the ones that, uh, that activate. So uh, we have a glass bulb that has a fixed volume. We expose that glass bulb to temperatures. We see an increase in the temperature uh, within uh, that glass bulb. And uh, for those of you that uh, might be familiar with some engineering concepts, there's a relationship between pressure, volume, and temperature. And so as we increase uh, the temperature, we increase pressure, and as we increase uh, pressure in that fixed volume, we ultimately activate that sprinkler. Now when we take a look at a uh, facility, and we take a look at where a uh, fire starts, what happens is that right above that fire ignition location, we see the highest temperatures. And then as uh, we kind of extend beyond that center point at the ceiling, we see a decrease in the temperature. Right? And then as the fire begins to grow, that temperature uh, begins to spread out from that, from that center point. Right? So what we need to do is we need to strategically position our sprinklers uh, so that they uh, efficiently and effectively distribute water uh, to fight our fire hazards. Now when we talk about automatic sprinklers, what happens is that the automatic sprinklers have this spray pattern that's kind of like an umbrella. In general, what we find for any building over nine meters high is that we have to put uh, sprinklers within our rack structure. Uh, that particular uh, positioning in accordance with NFPA really lends itself to some challenging uh, configurations. Principally, what we find is that when people put sprinklers inside the rack structure, from an operations perspective, it's easy for them to uh, be hit by a forklift or by material handling equipment, and then potentially you have an inadvertent activation. What we often focus on is how we begin to look at uh, protection only at the ceiling. Uh, and as I mentioned, uh, depending upon the technologies, what we find is that at that nine meter building height, less than nine meters, we have a lot of, of options. So uh, when we look at freezers specifically, how we begin to kind of address them and protect them has always been uh, uh, kind of a challenge. And so uh, one of the companies that had been mentioned earlier was a company called Americold. We actually did testing with Americold to try and develop uh, solutions for refrigerated warehousing specifically. So uh, I talked about dry systems and pre-action systems as having an inherent delay in terms of uh, water delivery. And what I wanted to kind of show you is the difference water delivery time makes. So here we have two scenarios where all of the conditions are exactly the same, uh, but the difference here is water delivery. So if it takes 60 seconds for water to get from my valve to my sprinklers, we opened 71 sprinklers. We repeated that same test. Go ahead and, and we changed the delivery from 60 seconds to 30 seconds. Uh, and ultimately that reduced the number of sprinklers that activated from 71 to 25. So as we look at refrigerated warehousing, one of the things we find is that how quickly water can get to our sprinklers is very much influences uh, the extent of damage that we might see from that fire event. So that really led to a lot of protection options that we kind of focus on uh, today. It really covers buildings up to you know, 12 meters uh, in building height. Now, uh, one of the things we also find is that you, you just can't always address every type of application. So we introduced kind of a quell methodology, what we uh, sometimes refer to as a surround and drown uh, methodology that ties in our water delivery in terms of performance. 
And ultimately what we're trying to do is we're trying to uh, wait long enough for water delivery so that we can uh, open multiple sprinklers and deliver water directly above our fire ignition location.